So the Toronto Raptors' struggles in the postseason have been pretty well documented the past couple of years. There was the time that they pushed the Cavaliers to a 2-2 series, and LeBron James had the famous quote of, I've been in many adverse situations in my career. This is not one of them. This previous season, the Milwaukee Bucks pushed them nearly to a Game 7 as they went on a miraculous comeback, only for the Raptors to escape with the win in Milwaukee. But uh, Raptors fans were definitely sweating there. There was also the series in which Paul George nearly beat them by himself as he outplayed Kyle Lowry, DeMar DeRozan, and the entire Raptors squad before uh, Toronto eventually would win that in the seventh game. They've also had a couple run-ins with Paul Pierce, where he famously said they don't have an it factor, and that was when he was a member of the Wizards and they swept Toronto. But he's also defeated them in round one as a member of the Brooklyn Nets as well. However, I would like to believe that we may see a different Toronto Raptors team when this postseason comes around. Let's talk about it. I think it starts with DeMar DeRozan, who is still himself when it comes to his scoring ability. Should be said that his three-pointer has been a bit better this season. Still nothing too crazy. He's around 33% from there. But there was a stretch this season where it seemed DeMar was maybe even approaching MVP conversations. He has since dipped down from that. But there have been little pockets of this year where we've seen DeRozan just go a bit beyond himself. And I think that's one thing you were waiting for with him is when the postseason comes around, does he have another gear that he can get to? But the other thing is his playmaking. He is at a career high in terms of assist per game, assist percentage, and he's also been able to maintain a very good turnover percentage of only 9%. So he's not turning the ball over, but he still has a pretty high usage rate, and he's making plays for everybody else. DeRozan has had some trouble in postseasons when it comes to trapping defenses. Uh, weirdly enough, he was good against Milwaukee, but once they played the Cavaliers, he had a tougher time. It's a good sign to know that if defenses start loading up on him, that he's actually been able to still provide uh, Toronto with some productive basketball. And I think that just adds another nuance and it makes him a little bit more difficult to defend. So we're hoping that he can go up to another gear and he can make some plays. Next, we have to talk about Kyle Lowry, someone who has also famously struggled in the playoffs. The big thing here is how less uh, minutes Lowry is playing this season. He's averaging about 32 minutes a game this year. Whereas the past two seasons, he's played like 37 minutes a game, which is among the league leaders. You would hope that because he just doesn't have as high of a workload, he's not going to be as tired in the playoffs. And as a result, he can just simply play better. Because the last couple of years, him in the regular season versus him in the playoffs is like night and day. It's a drastically different player. So we would hope that while his box score numbers are not as pretty this year, it can lead to a better playoffs. He'll just feel more refreshed and he'll just simply be better for them. His usage rate is also a tad lower as well. I think part of that is because of how good the Raptors second unit is to where he doesn't have to play with them as much. That's something that I will touch on a bit, the Raptors bench. But also because DeRozan is making more plays for guys, it makes it to where Lowry doesn't have to do it as much. Now, if we can talk about how the whole team is making plays, Dwayne Casey made a point for these guys to just pass the ball more, and it's definitely working. Last season, they averaged about 18 assists a game, which was towards the bottom of the NBA. This year, they're at 23 assists per game, which is, I believe, like number seven or number eight. And one criticism that you could throw to them was that their offense would die down in the big moments, especially against good teams. It would just be Lowry and DeRozan isolations, Lowry and DeRozan pick and rolls, and they still do have some of that to them, but now there's just more creativity in their offense. And between DeRozan making plays for others and Lowry just not being as gassed on top of just the ball flying around a bit more often, you would hope that they wouldn't have to go all the way to seven games to beat the Pacers in round one, or they wouldn't be pushed to nearly a game seven against the Milwaukee Bucks when they're clearly the better team. 
Now I do still have my fears that they are going to regress back to what they've been for so long, which is just a really basic offensive team in fourth quarters. I do think it's happened a bit this year, but hopefully they'll be good. Uh, what's been very good is their defense. Defensively, Toronto has always been on the cusp of being one of the better teams in the league, around number 10 to 13 in defensive rating, we'll say. They are the third best defensive team in the NBA this year, which is a drastic improvement. I think part of this is because Dwayne Casey telling everyone to pass the ball around more, it gives you more of a energetic feeling throughout the roster to where guys are just more excited to move on defense because they know there's a decent chance they're going to get the ball on offense. I also think they've just had an influx of quality defensive guys through drafting well and all that, which we will get into. But suddenly you have a team that is top five in offense and top five in defense. That's typically a title contender. And for all of Toronto's struggles that you could have given them on offense, they've never been the best defensive team. Part of this is um, OG Ananobi and his growth, even in this season. I mean, I know he was drafted, so there's nothing to compare him by before this year, but still, it seems like he's getting better as the year goes along as a perimeter defender. You have Jakob Pertl, who is a quality defensive big man on pick and rolls and protecting the basket. There is also Pascal Siakam, who is one of my favorite players to watch play defense because he just flies around the floor, but he can also match up on a few different positions on the perimeter. So they're good on defense, but I want to continue with what I just said with Pascal Siakam and note that he is a part of one of the best lineups in the NBA, which is Toronto's second unit. There's him, there's Fred Van Fleet at the point guard position, sharpshooter CJ Miles, who can play anywhere from shooting guard to small ball four. I mentioned Jakob Pertl a moment ago. He's more than just a defender. And then there's also DeLon Wright, who can play uh, the guard position along with Fred Van Fleet for some versatile ball handling. I mean, these five together have a net rating of 26, which is pretty insane. And in the postseason, if this is a lineup that you can go to against other teams' benches, this can be the sort of thing that pulls you out of a, a drought or energizes your home crowd and can allow you to win a game. Now, Toronto really is about a 10-deep roster. So the Raptors are doing some things well, but I want to compare them to some of the other better teams in the East. I think their defense could give Boston some trouble just because a lot of time they need Kyrie Irving to bail them out. And as for Cleveland, I think the Cavaliers are, are beatable this year, man. They've struggled a little bit since the All-Star break with their new team. I mean, of course, LeBron James can win a series by himself, and I would probably still pick the Cavaliers to win against Toronto, but I don't think it would be as easy as it has been in the past. The Raptors have made a lot of improvements. DeRozan's gotten better. Kyle Lowry just has less of a workload to where he can probably be fresher for the postseason. Their defense has gotten better. They have a more versatile and dynamic offense, and they might be the deepest team in the NBA. These guys should be a problem in the postseason.